Welcome to another podcast at Nutriscience Labs. My name is Blaney McManney. I'm the Vice President of Sales. This is Gene Bruno, our Vice President of Scientific and Regulatory. We also have Ryan Gillen back with us. He's our new Business Development Manager. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. How are you doing? Nice to be back. Excellent. Um, so today we're going to be talking about five dietary ingredients for sports nutrition, where if you had to only have five ingredients, what would they be? Um, of course, we always put these things on Gene first to kind of just get uh, you know the creative juices going and just find out what he believes would be those number you know those five items that are the do without or at least um, Gene maybe take it away. And yeah, so I'll, I'll, I will give you my five with with the uh, proviso that you know I wouldn't actually use these all the time for formulating normally, but if I could only have five, mm -hmm. I would want to choose the ones that have the broadest reach and what they do and the most science behind them. So for me, it would be whey protein, creatine monohydrate, beta alanine, caffeine, and ashwagandha extract. Those would be the five that I would do. Um, and if you want to know why, I'll tell you. I certainly do, one. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of questions, you know, when you hear those, some of them are not a surprise, but uh, there's certainly a few in there that I got some questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. specifically from just, you know, personal curiosity. Um, I guess starting from the top, you know, we'll kind of start with whey protein. Sure. Um, start with why, you know, why would whey protein be? So, I mean, there's a lot of protein choices yeah. and there's many good protein choices. Um, the reason I chose whey is because whey protein uh, has the most science behind it. Human clinical research showing it to be effective at muscle repair, muscle growth, mm -hmm muscle hypertrophy, the whole nine yards, everything that you're looking for. So, um, and also you can use a good uh, whey extract that'll be very, very low in its lactose content or, or almost totally void of it. So you don't have any issues with that, unlike certain other kinds of milk proteins. And it just works so well. Also, its taste profile is pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, if you're formulating something and you're mixing it together, like for example, um, plant proteins are fantastic, I love them, but they can be a little bit more challenging in their flavor profile and maybe their, their chalkiness or grittiness, whereas whey is a much smoother kind of protein. So from a formulation standpoint, as well as just a solid science standpoint, I'd go for whey protein. Uh, it's, it's one of the very best. If possible. you had to pick, would you go isolate or concentrate? I would do a mix, okay. and that's what I normally do. See, isolate is fantastic, a lot of research on it, but if you do strictly isolate, then you get almost a little chalkier consistency. You do a blend of concentrate and isolate, both of which have science behind them. It, it, it's a better mouthfeel, it's a better uh, flavor profile, it just it tastes better. Yeah, it goes I, down smoother. I definitely tend to see when it's just isolate, especially when you're just you know, shaking up, half the cup is foam. You know, yeah, that, that's right. me, and when you use concentrate, Kind of cuts that, makes it creamier, right. tastes better. Well, that's that's exactly why I like to do a blend of both of them. And the nice thing is, there's actually published studies on both. So when you use them together, you get the benefits that both have to offer. And I mean, there's other benefits too besides all the mus muscle related benefits. There's you know immune system enhancing related benefits. There's a lot going for it. So you know, if you took out the lactose part, where let's just pretend that lactose issues didn't exist. Is there a specific benefit outside of flavor where concentrate would actually be more beneficial where maybe someone that doesn't know would actually be surprised to say that, well, concentrate maybe gotten a bad rap uh, in the past in terms of a protein source? So I'll say a couple things. One is if you look at just um, cost per kilo, mm -hmm. concentrate costs less than isolate. Right. And so if you have, so one benefit, not a scientific benefit, but just a financial one is when you're formulating a product, if you have a blend of the both, it's gonna be a little more cost effective. If it's all isolate, it's gonna be uh, more expensive. So that blend is better. But in answer to your question, um, really there aren't that much difference in terms of the total benefits. You know, Concentrate has a few studies on it for like um, appetite control and things like that. But the truth is that the isolate will work pretty much the same because at the end of the day, they have the same amino acid profile. It's really 
just a matter of their concentration and you know how small their peptides are and some things like that. But it's it's really ultimately the same for the most part. Okay. Um, in, in terms of taking it every day, you know, I think one of those things um, that probably comes up for most people that take I three supplements are uh, maybe safety, efficacy, or you know, just what would be the reasons why someone would or would not take a whey protein every day? Well, first of all, whey protein is incredibly um, safe and effective for use. If you look at um, uh, kids, you know, teenagers, whoever that are using. Uh, sports nutrition supplements and you have to be you know careful when you're younger what are you using are you affecting hormones what are you doing but the International Society of Sports Nutrition in their journal uh, they have indicated that whey protein is one of the single safest things you can actually use and you could absolutely use that daily why a it's a highly bioavailable protein um, high amino acid score um, you need protein every day it's a great source mm -hmm. there's no reason not to use it uh, it can be used safely and effectively every day. It's not one of those things you should, you know, oh, I better cycle it. No. And how important I know like on a lot of different, you know, supplements and protein products, it always says take within 30 minutes of that, you know, workout, that window. So is that window really that important? <clears throat> okay. I got to take it right after or within that 30 minutes of that exercise? So picture a bell curve, okay? And you're working out. And when you're working out, you are breaking down muscle tissue which you want to do because the breakdown of it stimulates your body to repair and assuming you have the substrates meaning the protein and amino acids you need to repair with then you get just a little bit better each time so it's like if uh, you think of muscle as a brick wall and working out as a guy with a sledgehammer knocking out some bricks afterwards they come back they put another row of bricks on and add a couple more and the same thing happens next time and a couple more so the muscle gets a little bigger and a little bigger well, the thing is, that little guy that comes and repairs, okay, he only, he only works certain hours, all right? And so what happens is it's an, it's an anabolic process. You have a, a greater anabolic process taking place after a workout, okay? So there is a bell curve of response. Now, if you take it two hours later, does that mean you won't repair? No, no, you'll repair, sure. As much? Maybe not quite as much. So maybe instead of putting on, you know, uh, five bricks, maybe you only put on two. Okay, but that window, it's really about, it's, it's not exactly 30 minutes, it's about 60 to 90, but you know, the sooner the better. I think maybe we go to just the next one, which personally was actually the very first dietary supplement I have ever taken back when I was a young man uh, in my earlier years, which was creatine monohydrate. Oh, yeah. and, and one of the things I noticed when I started taking creatine, and we're going back where it tasted terrible oh, yeah. back in the 90s, <laughs> um, dating myself. but. Uh, one of the things I noticed very quickly, I got swollen in a way, in the sense where I just felt like it was working incredibly, um, sure. and that my muscles were definitely noticeably getting bigger than they normally would have. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, I, I didn't take it forever, and um, you know, the proverbial, you know, the shrink or whatever people associate creatine with, where while well, you're taking it, um, maybe they're myths, maybe it's just perception, but. I think there's a couple of myths out there around creatine that we maybe we should solve or maybe just understand if they are true or not. Um, maybe with the first being, you know, maybe scientifically you can explain what's happening to the body sure. when you're taking creatine. What you saw, that plumping up of the muscle, that's real. Yeah. Uh, and that actually happens. Uh, but here's how it works. So your body produces ATP, the energy currency of the body. And when one of the, the P's, the phosphates, are cleaved off that molecule, it creates a spark of energy. Oh, but now it's no longer ATP, which is triphosphate, three phosphates. Now it's ADP. Man, that doesn't work. That won't give you energy. Creatine will actually recycle it. It'll give you another phosphate. Boop, now you got ATP again, so it's ready to go. That's nice. In the uh, biochemical process of recycling it, a water molecule is created. That's the plumping of the muscle you start getting a little more water in your muscle. Now, that's not real muscle growth, mind you. It is just a plumping up of the muscle, okay? But what happens is your body makes creatine and it makes it in response to resistance training. So what happens is you train hard and you, you need more energy and so your body makes creatine so you can recycle your ATP. Well, that presence of creatine in your muscle 
sends an anabolic signal to your brain saying, oh, we got a lot of activity going on, we need better repair. So it stimulates an anabolic process of repair. But guess what? If you take creatine, your body doesn't know the difference. It's like, ah, oh, I got creatine in the muscle. So anabolic signal still happens and you get better repair, which is why you find studies on creatine monohydrate being effective for muscle growth and repair, as well as for the energy and endurance area. Now, what happens to a lot of people is when creatine first came out, there was a lot of discussion about you got to do this loading phase, you got to use 20 grams or 30 grams or some huge amount of it, mm -hmm. and you got to do that for a certain period of time, and then you're back down and you can use a smaller amount. And um, yeah, there was some research on that. The problem is sometimes when you use these high amounts of creatine, you get a little, little cramping mm -hmm. that goes on, you can get a little, little discomfort. But they did subsequent studies where they said, you know what? You don't have to go up real, real high. You can just do like eight grams. I see a lot usually like five yeah. grams. Five, five and, 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 then, and then back down to five. I mean, or just stay at five. Because though the process may take slightly longer, it's much safer and it'll still work. So using anywhere from five to eight grams, you are really good to go. And you don't have to do these high, high amounts to get effective. So to be clear, if I was someone that did a lot of activity, I was a runner, and I started taking creatine. Is there, should there be a concern, uh, not even necessarily about stomach cramps, but muscle cramps, where now I go out and I start running and will someone develop, you know, a cramp in their hamstring or you know, cramps in their abdomen and, and their muscles? I mean, is that, is that a if, real thing or? If you are doing a reasonable amount of creatine, mm -hmm. like that five to eight grams, and you're doing that, you're gonna be generally fine. It, here's the caveat. All right, if you're going to go out and you're going to run, all right, do some exercise where, you know, that's an extended period of time and you're going to be sweating a lot, all right, um, what happens is um, you, your body's using all your water for, for perspiration, mm -hmm. all right. If you have something still sitting in your gut, all right, your body has to dilute it in order to absorb it. So if you got a, a powder like creatine in your gut, um, and you don't have enough fluid that you took in with it in the first instance, then your body has to give up some of its own fluid in order to dilute it sufficiently so it'll be absorbed. That will cause cramping. Okay. So if you're going to take creatine, my suggestion is don't guzzle down your creatine and go out for a 20 minute sure run. You, make sure you hydrate before you go out. Hydrate, yeah. Better yet, do it an hour, two hours beforehand if that's what you're going to do as opposed to afterward. And uh, you're going to be in much better shape and use plenty of fluid for that, you know. Is there a reason why you pick monohydrate over you know, like yes, any other forms? Yes, there is. And I'm, I'm going to tell you the reason. I have two reasons. One, it's very cost effective. Now, when I talk about cost effectiveness, you just have to understand after decades of formulating, um, you know, brand owners typically want something that works, but they want something that's cost effective and is going to be outrageously expensive. So I go for that, but here's the other thing. There's still the most studies on creatine monohydrate of any form of creatine. When creatine monohydrate came out, and I remember it, um, there was a lot of studies done and there was more and more and more, and then people would come out with a new form of creatine. I got this new form of creatine, it's very well absorbed. It's better absorbed than creatine monohydrate. Great, does it do anything once it gets absorbed? The, the, you got your studies showing it works. Well, no, it's, but it's well absorbed, you know, so what? <laughs> now, since then, some of the other forms have had some studies. One, two, three, as opposed to dozens and dozens of studies on creatine monohydrate. So from, from, for me, you get the most bang from your, for your buck for creatine monohydrate. Why spend more when you can use the form of creatine with the most research and that's the least expensive? Seems like a no-brainer to me. You're getting a sure thing, pretty much. Yeah, that's exactly it. That's right, right. Just sure yeah. thing with creatine monohydrate. All right, I feel like you know this is two things I'm probably going to buy at the store on my way home today. So why don't we get to the, <laughs> to the third one? Caffeine. Um, caffeine. Okay. This is. I think this one is actually kind of interesting because most people that are willing to take a product with caffeine as a dietary supplement are probably already have caffeine in their regimen. So. Yeah, because I usually oh, try yeah. and stay away from the pre-workouts that do have caffeine, just because I my caffeine from coffee and so Ryan how much coffee you drink 
I drink two cups. Oh, he's a lightweight. <laughs> I'm like a five cup a day guy. But that being said, I don't drink like, you know, like a vente, uh, you know, I generally do like a six ouncer. Yeah, that's what I got. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll do five, and you know there's actually research that five cups or more a day of coffee actually reduces your risk of diabetes. The reason why is because the coffee also contains Well, that's, that's also the joke, like 10 right. sugars in it. Yeah. So, uh, that's how you drink the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I drink it black, so. Me too. Anyway, but um, so, so caffeine, which is you know obviously the primary ingredient that is giving you uh, the benefits of, of coffee, aside from the chlorogenic acid for your blood sugar, but that's the one the caffeine is for the energy, for uh, mental focus, for endurance, all of those th good things that go along with it. And there's plenty of studies on it. I mean, a lot of studies on it, and plenty of studies on it also in sports nutrition in helping with endurance and helping with mental focus. Um, so I'm, I'm a proponent of the use of caffeine, but within reason. You see some products out there where they'll just put in like huge amounts of caffeine. And it's like, no, nah, that's not what you want to do. You want to use a reasonable amount of caffeine and you want to use it along with some other things to give the effect because all you're doing is just putting it in there with nothing else you know, you can go buy no-dose in the store, you know. Uh, if you combine it together with other things, you can get a really profound effect. You know, one of the things that I like to combine caffeine with is the amino acid L-theanine. Um, one of the reasons I like it is because if you take 100 milligrams of L-theanine and you use 50 milligrams of caffeine, which is like the amount you find in half a cup of moderately brewed coffee, okay? you actually get some really good energy effects and cognitive enhancement effects um, at that low level. And the other thing that happens is, you know, some people are sensitive to caffeine, they get a little jittery. Uh, L-theanine stimulates brain alpha waves, which is, has a calming effect. So your energy is calm, but it's energy. It's not like a jittery energy. And so you get this smooth energy that you can do whatever you need to do. You concentrate better by having that combination, and by the way, there's several studies showing that exact dosage level has great results. So that's a nice combination. You can use a little bit and have a good effect. You can also use 100 milligrams of caffeine. I mean, obviously you can use more, but generally when I formulate, I tend to do with 100 milligrams or less of caffeine. So in fact, Ryan was mentioning, you know, a cup of coffee, mm -hmm. it's a natural source of caffeine. <clears throat> A lot of the pre-workouts that you see are, uh, are using caffeine anhydrous, synthetic form, mm -hmm. um, combination of two, sometimes natural, sometimes synthetic. Does the body know the difference? No. No. So you pretty much will get the same type of caffeine. You're gonna get, look, you know, ca caffeine anhydrous is pretty much just pure caffeine, okay? Now, can you use other kinds of caffeine sources? Sure, you can get um, basically a caffeine derived from a uh, coffee material or a caffeine derived from a tea material that's 95% caffeine. So it's, so yes, it might be 99% with caffeine and hydrous, and it's only 95% with mm -hmm. the others, but you know, it's, it's not much of a difference. The difference is really a marketing difference, um, that it appeals to an audience who, who would prefer a natural source of caffeine. And I like natural sources of things too, but I'm a scientist. So I look at it and say, what does the research show? There's no difference in how your body perceives it, all right? And so it's gonna work the same either way. But again, there is a marketing advantage to using the natural sources. So back to the same question that I posed with um, creatine, and maybe it's a myth, maybe it's not, cramping. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like caffeine and um, vigorous athletic um, exercise and sweating, if you weren't taking the caffeine, maybe you didn't see the cramping happen in your muscles, and if you did take the caffeine, maybe you are. Is it a myth? Is it coincidence? Is it real? So, one of the things you need to think, remember with caffeine is, remember I said I, I like to formulate with a reasonable amount? Yeah. See, caffeine has a diuretic effect. And so, you're gonna lose fluid if you use, the more caffeine you use, and, and if you're a big coffee drinker, you know this, because you drink, you drink coffee and you're like, eh, I gotta go use the boys room, you know? And because you, you just gotta pee often, it has a diuretic effect. If you have a loss of fluid, all right, you're more likely to get cramping. Right. If you use a lot of caffeine, you 
you're going to have a much more profound diuretic effect. Right. One of the reasons I like to formulate with lower amounts of caffeine, so it doesn't really have that. You take some product where you're like, oh, it gives you 400 milligrams of caffeine or something. Yeah, yeah, you might have some problems. That's like a little over overblown. Right. And you need to keep it at a more reasonable level. All right, I'm going to flip this around. I'm going to ask you guys some questions sure. about beta alanine. So, what have you heard is the biggest complaints about beta alanine? The tingles, I would yeah. say. The sting. Yeah. The sting and tingles. So, <clears throat> if you. But also, one of the biggest selling points because I've it's had experiential. people and say, I feel it working. That's exactly right. Yeah. Now, you can get as the only other thing out there that has a similar effect is niacin. The right. B vitamin niacin. niacin. You take that, flush. it'll create the niacin flush. You get kind of red, you get kind of tingling, maybe a little itchy, and uh, you definitely know you're taking it and it's doing something. Yep. Okay. Well, similarly with beta alanine, you do get that. And while there are some ways to reduce it slightly by dividing the <clears> dose <throat> throughout the day, um, by um, you know, using it with some food that can help to reduce it. But the truth is, truth is, in research, even 800 milligrams would stimulate some, and you know, people are using 2600 or, or much higher. Yeah. Um, but the good news is, there's some good science on beta alanine, and it really has a very good effect on athletic performance, uh, athletic recovery. Um, it has some just. Uh, very noticeable differences when you use it, which has made it very, very popular. Um, the big issue really has been this um, issue of, uh, uh, of the tingle, you know, which it, yeah, some people like very much and others don't. Now there's actually some new stuff on the market, which I'm not going to go into the details of it, but there's a material that you can actually combine with beta alanine, which helps to reduce the tingle, but not the effectiveness. And so that's an area that you can examine. Those of you who are watching this, you want to know about it, come to uh, Nutri Science Labs and uh, we'll make a product for you that, that, that'll do that. But meanwhile, um, beta alanine, again, one of the most uh, experiential, effective products out there. When I think of things like, to me, when creatine came out, it was kind of took the industry by storm. And to me, beta alanine is one of those kinds of materials that works so well uh and but is that double-edged sword of having that tingle which people like and people hate so what is it actually doing i mean what is the beta alanine in layman's terms if i'm taking it like my body is now what what is that stinging i mean you know. beta alanine plays some different roles in the body it will create it will it actually does some stuff to help improve circulation mm -hmm. which doesn't sound like a big deal but it's a huge deal because when you improve circulation in the body, you get um, all the nutrients, all the amino acids, everything being delivered to where they need to go more effectively, and waste materials from the cells being dumped out and gotten rid of more effectively. And so it it's, works very well. And the interesting thing about it is, part of this whole process has also resulted in improvements in muscle hypertrophy, so you actually get better muscle tone, and you just have much greater endurance. So it has this effect that is just very profound, and it's so funny. Less time has been spent on the mechanism of action, and more time has been spent on studying the overall effects of using it. And the mechanism of action seems to be pretty basic, mm -hmm. you know, as I described, but the effects are, are just quite marvelous. Um, you use this stuff, I've never known anybody who's used it and not had a good result. They may not have liked the tingling, or they may have liked it, but they've always had a good result from it. Have you ever heard of anybody who's used it and said, oh, it doesn't work? No, I, I think everyone says it works. They either you know, enjoy the workout, they get the tingles, but they might not have, like it. Have, but have you used beta alanine? I use it every time mm. when I work out. Tell me, tell me what your experience is with it. I'm curious. I mean, to hear that. I definitely get the tingles. I don't mind the tingles. Mm. I think it shows that you know, it's maybe, working. I'm, I'm ready to go work out, uh, get in the zone, you're ready, ready to go. But I've also used it not only just for you know, lifting weights, but going for runs or on the bike rides. It Makes does sense. help out with you know your muscle endurance. But if I'm doing something like that or a run or just a long bike ride, I will just use it as a single ingredient. 
instead of like a full pre-workout, I'll sure. just take maybe a gram or two and just use that and that's it. What do you like? You like to mix it in water when you do water it? Water or, you know, a carb drink or something like that. Mostly just water, just take it down and off I go. But I think it's a great ingredient. I use it for every workout and I have great results with it. So you kind of answered my question that I had with that, which is one I love to ask basically about almost every ingredient in the industry. Do you take it and it builds up over time and it has an effect or do you have to take it the day or the timing of your workout? So in other words, I skipped taking beta alanine today, but I took it yesterday and the day before that and the day before that, and let's say I've been taking it for months. Is it in my system when I go for that workout that I'm not actually taking it before? No, it's not really in your system because basically beta alanine is type of amino acid. Right. <clears throat> your body processes it, it uses it. Um, and if it's not there, it's not there to do the job. Unlike certain other nutrients mm -hmm. that even if you didn't take it, you still get a benefit from it. Some if nutrients are stored in your body, it's not. You know, it has a half-life, it, it goes away after right. a period of time. So you really need to use it on the days that you need it. Uh, you can use it daily, right. but uh, you definitely need to use it on the days when you have an athletic activity that you want to get some performance enhancement benefits from. Sure. Yeah, so, I usually take it 10 minutes before I go to the gym. I'm ready to go. Yeah, and you by feel, the time I get right? there, right. I'm on my drive and I'm already feeling You feel the tingle and you're like ready to go. scratchiness in the neck and I look out the window in my car, my mirror, and I got red right. marks all over Little red marks, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and have you have you talked to people who've used beta alanine before? Oh yeah, I actually had lunch with a, a new client the other day who said that was his favorite effect of taking a pre-workout product was he knew that it was ready and you know kind of got him pumped up to do his work. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, it works well. So, so the first three things we talked about, um, you kind of explained how creatine monohydrate works in the body and whey protein, we know the source of that. And of course, caffeine, mm -hmm. I think everybody knows a natural yeah. source of yeah. caffeine. Beta alanine, does it exist naturally? I mean, can you eat a carrot and there's beta alanine? I mean, where, where does it exist in nature or does it not? And do you only really get it from a synthetic source? Yeah, so the answer is you, you, you can't really go to a dietary source and get any kind of substantial amount mm -hmm. of beta alanine. I mean, it's, alanine is an amino acid and it, it's a beta form as opposed to an alpha form no big deal. Um, I don't really think of it so much as synthetic, although it is synthesized, uh, because you know the alanine is still a natural source. Right. You know, um, but you can't find food sources of it. You, it, that's just not going to happen. You have to, you have to um, get a, a supplemental source in order to get the effect that you're looking for. You know, um, it helps in the development of cardiacine in your body, which is something you can get some, you know, but this form is the form that works. This form is the right. form that has the effects that you want. Got it. So last but not least, ashwagandha. So let me just say that we could spend a whole podcast and then some discussing ashwagandha. And since I know we have other podcasts to do where ashwagandha is going to come up, I'm going to talk about it at a high level and mm -hmm. hit some sort of bullet points about it. But let me start by saying okay. ashwagandha, sometimes called Indian ginseng because it comes from India, but it's not a ginseng, but it is an adaptogen like ginseng. Uh, adaptogens help your body to adapt to stress. If you're too high, it brings you lower. If you're too low, it brings you higher. It helps to balance you out and create homeostasis. But it's not just for general stress, it affects so many systems of your body in so many positive ways, which is why when you see research done on adaptogens like ashwagandha, you can see the research all over the board, oh, cognitive or testosterone or stress or uh, uh, so many things. Mm -hmm. You're like, how can it be all these things? Because it's an adaptogen and it affects so many systems of the body. Now, there are a few, you can use just a standard ashwagandha root powder, there's some ashwagandha leaf and root combinations. Um, you could use an extract, you could use a powder. Use a powder, you gotta use much higher doses. In the grams, mm -hmm. if you're using an extract, then you're looking at milligrams. And some of the effects are very profound. From a sports nutrition standpoint, some of the effects have to do with 
helping to um, increase testosterone levels. Um, some of the effects have to do with really helping with athletic endurance, improving like VO2 max if you're, um, the, the way you process oxygen to have it be more effective in your, in your uh, workout. Um, and, uh, and some really great effects on stress, even stuff like helping to reduce like um, stress eating, mm -hmm. if you're eating because you're nervous or whatever. Ashwagandha has so many fantastic effects. It's one of the supplements I use every day because it's so effective at what it does. And um, so just like really impressive studies. Um, I, I geek out over the studies, you know, but um, I sit down reading studies on ashwagandha and, and you know, I got a master's degree in herbal medicine. And so I, I study it, but I, I never get tired of reading new studies on ashwagandha. I, I always get surprised, oh my God, they just did a study on this. This is fantastic. It's a new thing that ashwagandha can do. And then I read how, you know, how they think it's doing this it makes total sense. And it frequently comes back to its adaptogen, its adaptogenic properties. Right. So to me, you can combine ashwagandha with so many things and get a fabulous result. Even some of the things we talked about here, heck, you could combine it with beta alanine. <clears throat> well, maybe not because uh, beta alanine, uh, ashwagandha has a uh, kind of a bitter taste you would think in a capsule. But if you took it at the same time, they would have complementary effects mm -hmm. in terms of the, um, the, the energy kind of endurance effects you get. You definitely combine it with caffeine. Uh, you get a similar kind of uh, effect, but they each do it from a different angle. I mean, just uh, really, really uh, uh, an all-purpose adaptogen in sports nutrition and in so many other ways. I, I know I wax poetic about the uh, ashwagandha, but yeah. I can't say enough good things about it. Really. Well, I have two questions for you. The first question is, depending on the application, right? We are talking about sports nutrition and working out. Yeah. Is there different dosage amounts for different applications? Okay, the answer to that is it really depends on the extract. Let's say, for example, you are using a branded material called KSM66. Mm -hmm. Almost all the research is around 600 milligrams of that a day, right? Oftentimes done like 300 milligrams twice a day. Then you can look at other materials like Sensorol, another uh, ashwagandha extract. So you've got research on that at different amounts, mm -hmm. 125 milligrams, 500 milligrams, different amounts for, for different purposes. So, um, you know, the, uh, the amount that you need really depends on the extract being used and what was shown in research for it to be effective at, at those doses. But the nice thing is the doses are, compared to some things in sports nutrition, they're just not that high. No, it's actually quite affordable. I mean, even from um, the consumer level of buying KSM trademark uh, ashwagandha in the store, it's, it's not overly expensive. I mean, no, it, it's, it really it really is. And there's yeah. some new ones I've seen come out too, some of which I've even written about in some articles that, that show, you know, where they studied it for like cognitive effects. Right. You know, those other stuff, but that's what they studied it for. You know, so there's new ones coming out all the time, but the first two I mentioned are probably the most well-known and most well-researched. So I guess, so effects. my second question, um, it also has to do with dosing. Is there a limit <clears throat> to where you might be taking too much? Where that's a good question yeah. because look, here's the thing. You don't, it, you can't go by this rule if a little is good, a lot is better. Mm -hmm. That's just not how it works on in most things in life. Right. And it's certainly true of a lot of herbs. Uh, you know, it's called herbal medicine for a reason. You don't go, hey, listen, if a couple of aspirin works great, maybe 10 will work even better. No, you don't do that. Yeah. All right. That's not good for you. That's not how it's going to work. And Herbs have medicinal effects and have, uh, in addition to medicinal effects, they will have um, all kinds of wellness benefits. But use the amount shown in research to be effective. There are some things that you can actually, you can get, remember that bell curve we were talking about? You can have diminishing returns. You go, okay, if you use this much, th this much, you get this benefit. If you use this much, you get this benefit. Now you use this much, it starts going down. All right, some things don't work as well. Because remember, adaptogens are all about balance, right. creating balance. Taking a crap load of an adaptogen doesn't create balance, that creates imbalance. Right. So stick with the amounts used in the research 
and you're gonna do great. Go way over that, you know, you're not gonna do great. Huh? Well, you know, it's funny with the um, the title of the Baptist is I think we talked about it in our last podcast as well, and we're kind of talking about it in this one. Uh, and we're probably not going to go too far into them, but I, it is still a category where I hope the next time that we're doing a podcast, uh, we're talking about adaptogens because there's a lot more, and I certainly have a lot of questions. Oh, listen, about I'll it. tell you. Yeah, I could talk about it. Yeah. Ashwagandha, ginseng, rhodiola. I mean, it goes on yeah. and on. All the adaptogens and all the wonderful things they do. Okay, great. Um, well, I think you know that probably wraps up. Unless you have any other questions. No, topic, I mean, I think that uh, covers everything discussion. for you know those five. Pretty much main ingredients that are used in pretty much almost every you know sports nutrition. Well, those would be the there. five. If I could only have five, those would be the five. Luckily, I can have more than those <laughs> that I formulate, but those are five great ones. Well, as always, thank you for watching. If you have any questions, please fill out uh, the bottom in the comments section, and don't forget to like. All right, thank you so much, guys. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. All right.